Okay. Oh, you've touched the card, apparently. Do you know how to hit? Yes, I did. It's you recording. Did, it's recording. Yeah. Right. Okay, <laughs> welcome to another CITP <coughs> lunch talk. David, uh, as some of you have already met him, is a visiting IT policy fellow at CITP. He comes to us from the University of Cape Town, where he leads the net for d lab which is Network for Development Lab. He has a PhD in computer science from UC Santa Barbara. And David's research largely focuses on developing decentralized networks to enable in communities and individuals sort of build their own services and infrastructure, uh, or maybe own their own services and infrastructure. David has requested that uh, you only ask clarifying questions during his uh, presentation. He will leave time at the end for uh, other questions. So with that, I'll hand it over to David. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Tiffy. Uh, and thanks CRTP for um, yeah, for allowing me to talk about this topic, which I'm very passionate about. Um, so today I'm going to talk about community-owned networks, and the question is really around: um, Could um, this be a connectivity solution for Africa? Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of the building blocks required to build these uh, community-owned networks. My talk is going to be a bit like a sort of water insect bouncing over a, a pond. So, uh, you know, you might in, get through this talk a little bit dazed. Um, so let, let's see how it goes. Um, so we, before we sort of dive into looking at the connectivity problem in Africa, it's good to kind of step back and see what does the world look like now. So this is a picture of all the cellular connectivity um, across the planet. Uh, and... Uh, where it's lit up, there are cell towers. Currently, 88% of the world is covered by 3G or 4G. Um, uh, this is according to the GSMA uh, in 2017. But f only 48% of the world are actually connected to the Internet. Um, so there's this interesting gap. Of course, babies aren't using Twitter, so we have to kind of eliminate them. But... Um, uh, the, the rest of, of the, the adolescents and adults are, are not connected for a multitude of reasons. It's really linked to affordability of device and connectivity uh, and literacy and IT literacy. Um, this is the, the reason there's this gap between the 48 and the, and the 88 percent. If we look to uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the picture is more bleak. So we have 59% of the continent covered, which is actually not bad considering it was pretty low in uh, around 2000, 2001, around 10%. Um, but only 21% uh, are connected. So there's this even larger gap. Uh, but again, we have to see that Africa has a growing and swelling youth population. So we have to eliminate you know, babies uh, and kids up to the age of four, which is around 15%. But it's still a f very substantial gap. Um, and uh, again, it's linked to affordability of devices and, um, and connectivity. And also, especially in Africa, there's a, a, a literacy and IT literacy issue. Um, it's interesting to look at um, Wi-Fi versus cellular uh, connectivity when you look at the planet. So if I flick between these, you will notice uh, Africa gets darker but Europe and the U.S. get brighter with Wi-Fi. Um, so that just tells you that there's a lot more people who own personal Wi-Fi routers and universities and public spaces with Wi-Fi uh, in Europe and uh, the global north, as we call it. Um, so the other interesting thing is uh, the growth of Internet use year on year uh, has gone through a turning point. So it reached a kind of a knee around about 2012. So we've uh, connected the easy half of the world, uh, and it's now kind of starting to flatten off. Um, so when you see that, you realize you know, the current models that we have are starting to uh, hit a ceiling. Uh, and you see this also with um, smartphone unit shipments. So if there's less smartphones being bought, um, 
you know, less people are, are using this to connect. Of course, there, there's a, there are people sort of replacing their old phones, um, and there's some churn there, but when you start seeing negative year-on-year -year, year, uh, smartphone growth, there's definitely something going on. So the question I want to ask is, will the next 50% uh, of the world be connected through equipment that looks more like that, or equipment that looks more like this. Um, so what you're seeing over there uh, is my friend from Berkeley uh, who worked with, a, on the left, uh, an Indonesian uh, community network that installed a cell phone network in a tree. It's a great idea because as a tree grows, the signal gets better. <laughs> um, on the right uh, is, a, is a, con a community I'm working with in Cape Town that are powering the Wi-Fi network with wind and solar. So I want to step back and, and uh, if you'll bear with me, uh, look at a possible way of seeing what, what could happen with um, the community-owned network movement um, in Africa and the rest of the world by looking at what happened with electrification of rural America. So. In the early 1930s, 90% of rural Americans uh, had no electricity. Um, sorry, uh, oh yeah, only 10%, that's the same, uh, same thing, of rural Americans had access. Um, and at that stage, uh, the U.S. was 44% rural. Um, then Roosevelt, as part of the New Deal in 35, um, had an executive order to create the Rural Electrification Administration. There was new regulation to create um, loans um, and provide engineering support to these rural areas. Farmers in the community then formed co-ops, uh, paid their five dollars to join, and um, the growth of rural American co-ops uh, for electrifying uh, rural America started. By 2010, 42% um, of the nation's um, distribution lines are owned by rural cooperatives in the U.S. So my question is, if we look at rural cooperatives in 1935, could we, and this is now the picture of African uh, cooperatives in 2017, um, Africa has about a 60% rural population, not that different to the U.S., in uh, the early 1900s. Could this be a possible future? This is what uh, rural electrical cooperatives looked like in 2019. Perhaps that's what cooperatives providing broadband in Africa could look like in 2025. Um, interestingly, uh, these rural cooperatives are now rolling out broadband in the US. So there's around about 100 at the moment. Uh, rolling out broadband, and it makes sense because they have all this cable infrastructure that can run fiber on the poles uh, and so on. So we need to understand um, the model of building community networks, and uh, the model that's often used is this network's commons license, um, which is similar to the creative commons license you'll find for media and for software. So it basically says you have the right to join the network um, and the responsibility to extend it. Uh, you have the right to understand the network. Nobody can say, I'm filtering the traffic, but I'm not going to tell you what's going on. Um, you have the right to spread the knowledge about the network. Uh, you have the right to offer services and content on the network. And the freedom to use it as you wish without harming anyone else. So that last clause is something to protect from what's called the tragedy of the commons. So when you have a commons resource, you can have the situation where it's overconsumed and starts to hurt other people. For example, people might all put up very powerful antennas and just drown everyone else out. Um, so that's a, a very useful framework uh, for building these networks. Um, Another metaphor I like to, this is my own personal metaphor, uh, used to look at building networks is to see it as building a house on some foundations. And you have three axes. 
Um, one axis is infrastructure. These are the radios and the, the technology used to build the networks. Um, another axis is in the wireless world is spectrum. If it was fiber, it would be rights of way, way leaves, and so on. And then on the on, on the z-axis, you've got services. So once you put in the infrastructure, you have spectrum, you start building services. All of this sits on top of the foundation of regulation, and nothing can be done without skills. You need skills to have good regulators. Regulators need to understand how to, how to create regulation that is um, in the public good, and so on. Uh, and you need skills to build these networks. The problem is that the regulation has, has favored the very large, big national operators. So if you think of a house, they're building ginormous hotels and apartment blocks um, because they're getting a lot more spectrum, a lot more of the valuable spectrum. And the small cooperatives and community-owned networks have been getting tiny slices of spectrum. And so they kind of like can only build these small little houses. Um, so I'm going to kind of use that model as I, as I work through the, the presentation. So we also need to understand how hard it is to build networks in some of these areas. Um, so if you look at a typical rural area, um, you have very low population density, uh, which is very difficult for um, somebody putting up a tower that needs to get return on investment. Um, if your tower is only going to reach 50 or 100 people. Um, it's a very harsh environment. There's power instability, lightning, dust. Uh, a lot of equipment fails. There's a skill shortage, often of people to maintain the infrastructure. As I said earlier, low literacy and digital literacy, often poor regulation or misunderstood regulation, regulation that's not clear. Um, and a lot of the technology uh, and services that are deployed there um, are often not well suited for some of the above um, reasons. Um, interestingly, I've found um, many African people perceive the internet as a cultural threat. So, for example, they might have grown up um, building wire cars, uh, and that was their culture, and now their kids are playing Flappy Bird. Um, and, uh, and they say the internet you know, is destroying the culture that we grew up with. Um, probably not a unique problem to Africa, but definitely is something that is mentioned. Um, just to show you how insane um, the power issue is, I monitored power usage in a Zambian village over two weeks, and I saw multiple power failures in the day, some power failures lasting as long as eight hours. Um, I saw these brownouts where the power would drop to 40% of its normal value, and spikes where it was 100% more than its standard value. Now put most standard kind of equipment that you use, like your Wi-Fi router, in a, in a situation where that kind of power is happening and it usually blows up. So um, you need to make sure that the equipment suits these kind of harsh environments. Um, one of the real challenges in South Africa, although South Africa is pretty well covered by 3G, it's about 98% covered. Um, is the cost to communicate. So wealthy uh, users have these 24-month contracts and low-income users um, have prepaid packages, uh, data bundles. So, and we find that a typical low-income user will be buying lots of small packages as they get income and could be paying up to $28 for a gigabyte, whereas low-income low users are on 24-month contracts paying through 10 or 20 cents a gigabyte. Um, so you've got this insane difference in affordability between, uh, for access between low income users and high income users. Uh, I mean, this is, for me, absolutely perverse. Um, but operators get away with it. Um, many uh, low income users I've spoken to or surveys that we've done uh, in rural South Africa uh, they spend up to 20% of their income on connectivity. And this is income that's often from social grants um, that the government give them. Um, right, so 
on the I just want to look at these three axes now and and just pick through them. So the the first axis is infrastructure, um, the actual radios that you deploy. So traditional networks uh, effectively look like this, where you have towers and fiber uh, providing internet to the towers, and you have to invest fifty to hundred thousand dollars to put up these towers, and um, you know it will create wide coverage for um, a rural community, um, usually accessing through their cell phone. Um, mesh or ad hoc networks, on the other hand, uh, you will have smaller radios that are placed on people's roofs, um, and the radios discover each other and form links that build a mesh as you add radios to the network. And when you need to get traffic from source to destination, it essentially routes itself through the best route from the source to the destination. Um, now, there are many positives to this. So it's resilient to failure. If one of the nodes goes down, it can find another route. Um, it's very simple to install. Uh, a lot of routers that I've used um, put them on the roof, switch them on, give them a name, and they work. Um, it's really that simple. You don't need to you know, do any network training to, to set these up. Um, they are pretty low cost. You can get a lot of mesh routers for around about $50. Um, and it aligns well with the community network model where the, the community owns the network. So you own the router that you put on your roof or the cooperative could own the router that's put on the roof. The negatives are that it doesn't um, have the efficiency of a centrally managed system. You don't get quite the performance that you would with a, a standard, uh, say, cell phone network with a tower. And single radio meshes have some scaling issues. So I've done some studies back in 2012. I built this indoor lab with, I called it the graveyard, <laughs> <laughs> with all these uh, wireless uh, devices that we're routing traffic between each other. And um, it scales, uh, in my experience, somewhere near um, the throughput of one hop over n. So after five hops, um, the throughput would be around about 20% of the throughput of the first hop. Um, Gupta and Kumar have done some theoretical studies and shown it's not quite as bad as that, but that's roughly the, the type of scaling I've seen. There are ways to fix this. So you can use a uh, dual radio mesh, uh, and all you do is you add two radios to your device. <coughs> so for the first hop, you might use one channel, uh, and then the next hop uses a different channel with a different radio. And the advantage of that is you can have full duplex uh, between uh, where as the packet arrives uh, on one radio, it can be sent out the other radio. Um, on a different channel. Um, and doing this, you get around about a 5% drop of throughput. throughput um, and that's mostly due to uh, buffering uh, in the device. Um, so I, I went back to the first mesh um, that I installed in, in 20, uh, 2007, uh, where I partnered with the community in a rural area of South Africa. And um, I thought I'd just show this one because it's it's kind of an interesting historic mesh in that it was the first rural mesh in Africa. Um, it was around about 10, 10 nodes. Um, internet was coming into a clinic, and we, want, we needed to distribute this to some homes, to a school, to some farms. Um, now, the interesting thing is the satellite link was ridiculously slow, 512. KBPS, um, and you only had two gigabytes per month. <coughs> that was a cap. The clinic was only using, amazingly, uh, about 300 or 400 megs per month to send medical information, and they always had the spare capacity at the end of the month. So we went, let's share the spare capacity with a bunch of users in this rural village, because it's actually for forfeited every month. They just lose it. Um, 
and we, we set uh, a 50 megabyte cap per user. You would wonder what you could do with that, but <laughs> back then uh, people could browse quite a few web pages. Um, and um, we were able to provide uh, average sort of throughput of about 2.3 megabits per second to users. Now, the, they would never feel the effect of the slow satellite link because even though there was this scaling problem where they were getting slower and slower per each hop, um, because the satellite link was so slow and the Wi-Fi was so much faster, they never actually felt that scaling problem. So it was... Uh, we didn't even need dual radio mesh. The single radio mesh was quite ample. Uh, we were able to do great things like run a voice over IP SIP on this network and save the clinic calls between their remote site uh, around $300 a month um, and provide internet access to many users who hadn't ever seen the internet. Um, the device that really changed everything was in 2006... Uh, this little box, the Linksys WRT 54G. I'm sure many of you had them. Uh, this was the first router that had enough memory and flash that you could put embedded Linux in. And that opened up an enormous world um, of being able to install mesh routing firmware for $40. What we did is we stripped the electronics out, put it in waterproof, waterproof enclosures like you see over there, um, stuck it on the, the outside of a house and were able to do you know, four, four miles um, with a decent antenna. Even with an old can where, uh, that we used as an antenna, we were able to get three miles. Um, a can was great because, you know, that's basically free and we saved about 40 or $50 on the antenna. Um, since then, many uh, community networks that use mesh have have appeared. Um, some of the famous ones in Berlin, there's a mesh that's still running, about 380 nodes. GiphyNet started off as a mesh. It's now 35,000 and upwards nodes. Um, it's more of a kind of a mesh topologically, but because it got so huge, they're starting to do BGP routing between nodes and use standard internet routing protocols. Um, Where is that? This is in Barcelona. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, once your mesh starts getting large, you begin to uh, create clusters of meshes and uh, route with super nodes between these clusters because of the scaling issue. Um, <coughs> right here nearby, there's the New York City mesh. Um, and that's an interesting mesh in that they've had backhaul donated um, and you pay a voluntary fee to connect. So I think the minimum is $20. You, if you want to pay more, you can. Um, and you get uncapped internet in New York. And it's 401 nodes at the moment. Um, in South Africa, there's a 65-node uh, rural mesh that's very um, I've put links there if you want to read more about these networks. Um, so the next axis I want to discuss is spectrum, specifically spectrum sharing, which is a, a, a new technique uh, to use spectrum more uh, effectively. So it's useful to kind of understand how we got to this concept of, a loose, of exclusive use spectrum. Um, so back in sort of the early 1900s when Marconi created an arc and saw an electron move in a piece of wire, couple of miles away, um, uh, that became, uh, you know, Marconi wireless tel telegraphy. Um, he actually said he wants to own all the spectrum in the world because he needs it for his equipment to work. For, I'm very glad that didn't happen. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then after that, in 1906, they created the Radio Treaty, which was to protect spectrum from interference, actually to protect um, messages to ships from interference from hackers on the coast. Um, and they started looking at spectrum uh, from a country perspective and protecting it um, against interference. Um, if you look at 
the evolution of how it was used all the way to today, um, you know, we've got cellular appearing in 1983. The first time we thought about spectrum based on rules but not on exclusive use was really when we had license exempt spectrum in 1989. That became uh, what we use for Wi Fi. In 2008, the FCC made a bold decision to look at dynamic spectrum access and created rules for TV white space. But effectively, most of the spectrum is exclusive use. You allocate it across the whole country and you lock it down for a specific purpose or operator. Um, but you know, that thinking is based on sort of 1900s thinking where we had valves and very, very noisy electronics and you couldn't reuse that spectrum in other areas. Things have moved on, we've moved to digital. Uh, we are now, um, we have software defined radios, cognitive radios, and we have the ability to reuse spectrum. Um, so we can use some spectrum in another um, part of the country where it's not being used. For example, in rural areas, it's not being used in, in urban areas. So we need to move from this concept of right to exclusive use that we have uh, now with operators to this concept where they have the right to protection from interference. Uh, but this is going to be a long road, um, but a battle worth fighting. Um, it's also useful to look at the Wi-Fi success story. So in 2017, the global picture of Wi-Fi was for smartphones was 54 percent of internet traffic was being offloaded to Wi-Fi for smartphones. Um, Cisco says by 2022 that'll climb to close to 60 percent. Now what's really remarkable about this is that Wi-Fi has only had 80 megahertz um, versus cellular bands having 270 megahertz. And they've achieved that kind of level of traffic with only 80 megahertz of bandwidth. The reason is that Wi-Fi creates very small cells. So you can reuse spectrum if your cell size is smaller. So we understand why it happens, but it's still incredible that a technology that basically works by <coughs> saying, shut up if I'm talking, has achieved that. Um, so I like to use the road analogy for spectrum when we try to understand how spectrum is used. Uh, if you think of bands as lanes in a highway, in urban areas, the, the spectrum is fairly w well used. Um, cellular is mostly used. There's quite a few channels used for broadcast, s some military channels possibly. But if you go to rural areas, you'll find most of these highway lanes are empty. The problem is our current regulation says you have to stay out of all of these lanes, um, even if those lanes are actually available. Um, so the, the operators will always talk about there's a spectrum crunch, we're running out of spectrum. The reality is there might be some spectrum crunch in urban areas, but there's no spectrum crunch uh, in rural areas. So this concept of there being a spectrum shortage is actually an artifact of the fact that we're still stuck with exclusive use spectrum licensing. Um, so TV white space, as I said, the FCC approved that in 2008, um, is effectively a concept that says in blocks where um, spectrum isn't being used by digital or in South Africa we still have some analog TV <laughs> signals, um, you have this um, spectrum called white space. Um, they should never have called it white space, especially in South Africa, <laughs> our history. <laughs> should be called gray space but, um, or something like that. But anyway, um, we, didn't dis we weren't there when these decisions were made. Um, any of you used to have old televisions will know when you had a TV that had snow on it. That doesn't happen anymore. But when you would click through the channels and there was snow, that was effectively white space. So what's so great about white space? Um, well, if you had a, a rural area and you wanted to
distribute um, a signal to all your users, if you took something like 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi with an Omni antenna to other Omni antennas on a roof, uh, you might get about two kilometers. If you use 600 megahertz TV white space, you would get eight kilometers. So, and you also get better trend penetration through foliage and through buildings. Um, if you look at it on a sort of basic physics level, you have about 16 times more area that you can get from TV white space compared to 2.4 gigahertz um, Wi-Fi. Um, if you look in South Africa um, at how much TV white space there is, um, blue being sort of all TV white space, red being some fairly limited number of channels. So red, where you see red there, it's effectively our urban areas. Um, what I found is if you move into rural uh, areas or areas just out, outside the city, you get between 70 and 90 percent um, TV white space avail availability. In the cities, it's around about between 30 and 50 um, percent. Now, the great thing is that um, if you look at where are the areas that are well suited for TV white space uh, and how many people live there, um, doing some studies on what area population densities that are well suited to less than one gigahertz, um, I've found that 42% of the population are living in those prime areas. Um, so that's a great number of people to connect um, where there's currently um, either only expensive cellular or very poor coverage. Um, I did some studies comparing South Africa to the US. Um, having studied in California, I decided I'm going to drive around a lot with a spectrum analyzer on my roof. Um, and what I found is that in Fresno, if I can call that urban, <laughs> nobody wants to go to Fresno except people like me who want to study TV white space. <laughs> um, there is very little TV white space, um, maybe 20% channel availability. Whereas in the middle of sort of um, the valley uh, in rural California, there's around about 50% availability. In South Africa, urban areas looked like rural America. We have around about 50% availability in an urban uh, area like Pretoria. Uh, in a rural area, um, sometimes there is almost 100% TV white space availability. Um, what you see there is just sort of some other interesting information about uh, the U.S. cleared their, their TV um, band in 2009 for digital TV. Um, so TV used to go up to uh, 850, and that was cleared for and uh, for cellular operators and sold off to AT&T and Verizon. Um, South Africa actually is still busy clearing that. Our TV goes up to 900 megahertz, and we are still in the process of auctioning that uh, spectrum off. Um, so if you now look at this mix of TV white space and Wi-Fi, um, what can you do now that you have TV white space? Well, there's some links that might have trees in the way or be just out of line of sight with Wi-Fi. With TV white space, you can now build links um, where there's vegetation in the way or where you're just out of line of sight. So uh, the ultimate device is a device that has both. So I developed this um, hybrid Wi-Fi TV white space box that has both a TV white space and a, and a Wi-Fi radio and if it finds um, a link where uh, it can't reach uh, the other end with Wi-Fi because there's foliage, it'll use a TV white space link. Um, so the thing to remember is that Wi-Fi generally will give you more capacity if you can see the other Wi-Fi radio whereas uh, TV white space will give you lower capacity but better coverage. So having both, you have the best of both worlds. The clarifying yeah. question, yeah. since we're limited to clarifying questions, yeah. uh, what protocol are you running over TV white space? Um, so this is uh, 802.11. Um, this particular 
device I used was just down converted Wi Fi into 700 megahertz, 600 so you could presumably megahertz. do much better if you were to use like some of the more the like better protocols. Yeah, there's some native ones like 82.11 AF and so on, but those radios were way too expensive. Uh, we have this problem with TV white space, it hasn't reached scale of economy yet. So I just use a simple down converted Wi Fi radio. Um, but the routing protocols I used um, ran over both radios. Um, so another exciting um, development is that uh, Open Cellular, um, this is now with Facebook, are working on what I'll call white space cellular. So they've developed this $1,500 LTE base station, which um, c you can deploy in a, in a community network. Uh, and it will use either unallocated blocks of spectrum by the government, or it can use, in a, similar to TV white space, spectrum that isn't being used in a certain geographical area. Um, this is going to be a hard fight because we have to somehow ask the operators if they're prepared to share the spectrum. And there's a long uh, regulation battle ahead to, before we actually get there. Um, I'll actually be in Amsterdam tomorrow at the Telco Infra Project Summit to ask the operators if they'll be kind and <laughs> start sharing their spectrum. Um, the last axis I want to uh, discuss is services. So once you have some infrastructure, what kind of interesting services can you deploy? Um, I've done some uh, studies in, uh, this is in a Zambian village, to understand how do people um, communicate and specifically how do they share messages or content with each other when they have a tool like Facebook. Um, so we studied Facebook traffic in a, a Zambian village over a number of months. This study we had uh, 14,000 or so instant message um, uh, instant message messages between users in the or users in the village and users outside the village that they were communicating with, and we found that around about if you look at that picture, the dark sort of red uh, lines are instances where there is a lot of traffic between users in the village, uh, and we found that up to 60% of the instant message traffic was between users in the same village. So they were sending messages all the way to California over a satellite link and coming all the way back into the village, um, which is insane. Uh, and we found the same thing for sharing images. Um, so the point is, does that look like a design for locality of interest that we saw uh, in a Zambian village? Um, we also did some questionnaires with people in South Africa and Zambia to find out how they're sharing images, video, and audio. And we found that <coughs> nobody was using online services to share video. They were sharing video on USB sticks and sitting around a cell phone in the grass uh, watching each other's videos, um, which makes sense because the cost is exorbitant. Um, so to illustrate this, let's say a local artist uh, wanted to upload a hip-hop video in a, in a village. In South Africa, the HD video would cost them about $4 for three minutes to upload. Uh, all their fans, each time they are trying to access that hip-hop video, would be paying between $1 and $4, depending on the, the, the quality. Um, can't you host that content much closer to the user? So we built a solution. This was back in uh, 2012. We created a system called Village Share, and we thought about it and went, well, we don't want to rebuild the social network. Everybody's already got the social network on Facebook. The problem is the content is living in the wrong place. So with this app, you would say, uh, you know, share your music or your video with your friend. Um, it would then know that that friend lives in the village and place the content on a local server in the village. So you're still using the low bandwidth messaging part of Facebook using the normal international servers, but putting the, the high um, bandwidth content 
in the local village. Um, How, yep. So Facebook supported that? Is that like you used an API from them? Or? We used the Facebook API, and we just built an app. Um, right. There was one interesting, interesting <coughs> trick. We had to do a DNS override <laughs> um, to place the content uh, in the, well, to access it in the local village. Um, the problem with this, this was great, but when people ran out of phone time, they were firewalled from their content. <laughs> so it wasn't yet an ideal solution. Um, we currently have a project called Dinetti where we're now looking at deploying lots of analogs to internet services in a, in a local context. So we are adding things like Diaspora instead of Facebook, um, Nextcloud instead of Dropbox, Rocket Chat, um, well, not instead of, but with um, WhatsApp. Um, so these are all services you can deploy on a local server in a, something like a Docker container. And we're also creating platforms where you can have uh, like VM hosting locally using something like Eucalyptus instead of using Amazon EC2. And the great thing is these are open platforms that you can innovate on. Um, we're not saying this is how the service should look. We want people to innovate and create their own content, create their own services. Um, when we work with these communities, we want to be co-researchers with them, design the solution with them. Uh, this is um, part of the Orlando uh, Borda's participatory action research type of um, thinking. The key thing is we want to amplify the locality of interest. So when one looks at the global internet today, we kind of move uh, from our thoughts straight onto the internet. Twitter is probably the worst culprit. As you think, your your thoughts go onto, uh, <laughs> for, you know, Facebookistan and global uh, Google them. <laughs> the way I'd like to uh, see these services look is more like this: we form an idea in our thoughts and we chew through them in the privacy of our minds, then we begin to share them with our local communities. Um, and then some of, these, um, some of these ideas might move from the local communities to the, to the global Internet. Some of them might stay. They might have a perfect, happy resting place in your, in your local community. Um, so we want to create an onion layer uh, for these to um, live in. So just to um, conclude, uh, some of the current work we're doing is all of the above. Um, and uh, we are deploying a, or working with the community network to deploy uh, in an area called Ocean View, where there's around about 60% unemployment, a major issue with affordability. Uh, I'm looking at an interesting model where a cooperative is rolling out uh, a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots. We want to look at adding individual ownership to that, where if you buy a router and you put it up, you can, you can be rewarded for routing uh, traffic. Um, and we would like to see if that helps to incentivize expansion of the network. And we're using blockchain for that. Uh, so this is a project I'm currently working on uh, over the next couple of months. So the way forward really is we're looking for intention amplifiers. Uh, the intention of a community network is to close the connectivity gap, close the affordability gap. We, can, we need networking infrastructure that's simple to install. We need regulation and technology to support spectrum sharing. Uh, we can use these micro-cloud localized service platforms to encourage local content creation. And we need to have skills development uh, through workshops, training programs, so that people can build these kind of services and uh, infrastructure. So my question is, could we use something like the Universal Service and Access Funds? In, in America, it's called USF. Um, as a sort of a new deal for building these cooperative-based community networks. Um, 
And can operators maybe be incentivized to share the spectrum by maybe getting a discount on the USAF fees? They have to currently pay between 1% and 3% um, uh, USAF fees. Would that be enough for them to be a bit kind? Um, also, there is a dark or realistic side we have to also look at. Local communities and cooperatives can go two ways. They can either flourish or there can be a relational breakdown uh, in these communities and they can collapse. So in a sense, they're also more, uh, they're less stable than a, a commercial network which is uh, coming from the outside and has no particular uh, local interest or knowledge of local power structures. Um, and the next billion connected users are probably mostly going to be using this for entertainment. Um, or doing something we don't yet know, some, something unexpected. And, you know, they might not be watching Khan Academy videos or watching the crop prices, uh, which NGOs and uh, a lot of <laughs> researchers like to have pictures of a Kenyan farmer with his phone checking crop prices. Maybe there's a kid playing, you know, a uh, flappy bird, and... Um, or playing online games with his friends, um, that's also fine. Whatever happens is fine, but um, it needs to come from the community and not be pushed on the community from the outside. Last metaphor. This is a communication, telecommunications jar. If we fill it up with just the Verizons and the Comcast, these are the big rocks. We will never fill the jar. We need these cooperative community-owned networks, the small rocks, and perhaps add individual ownership, which could be the sand. Um, thank you. <laughs> All right. Questions? Ten minutes. So in, in one of the last slides uh, on the use of fees, uh, yeah. I think in the United States those are just passed on to the customers. So whether they're reduced or not sort of doesn't have any impact on the telecom and right. So no incentive for them to do anything one way or another. Is it different in um, South Africa? Or, or, I, or I guess they wouldn't say that, but that's probably what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like a line item, like on your phone bill it used to be, you know, okay. use of fees. So. Right. But if the so if the you, the fees were reduced because they share a spectrum and the the fees were kept the same for the for the users, they would be pretty pissed off. Um, <laughs> if they knew that that was happening. Um, yeah. I was just wondering um, how you approach communities <coughs> about putting these kind of networks in. You would sort of have to talk to federal officials, local officials, and uh, in terms of, I like the comparison to the New Deal. The big difference seems to be that when you have federal funds, that makes things pretty easy across these various territories. So right. How, is that a concern for you, how to fund these kind of networks? Yeah. So. Um, the first stage is obviously, um, you know, communities need to show their intention to do something. So we typically work with communities where they are saying we would really like to do this, uh, and as a, or well, as a research organization like UCT, we'll come alongside you and help you. Um, we can get grants through the university to help. Uh, so we've we've said we will help you for one year but we would like to see you be sustainable after that one year, uh, which is why they have to charge for the access. They're, they're charging a dollar a gigabyte, um, and if they scale enough, they can be sustainable. Um, I want to go beyond that and say we could use USAF fees um, to also um, seed uh, building towers, um, getting equipment. With the same model, instead of university, now it will be USAF fees to just give people a leg up, kind of like the rural cooperatives got a leg up from Roosevelt, uh, to just at least get through the first hurdle, the first year. Yep. So I'm from the part of the world uh, that was really changed by the REA. Texas, yeah. there's so many remote communities there. The 20th century didn't arrive in some places until about 1935. Yeah. Um, my feeling about this is that I'm absolutely fine if it's the blue guys because in the experience of Texas, um, big cooperative. Big the blue guys, the 
Yeah, community it, owned. No, community, yeah. Um, you're exact. Without Roosevelt, there would have been uh, the farmer would have been consigned to darkness. And it's yeah. not just entertainment. Although the movies and the radio were a huge part of it, it was yeah. washing machines and all the things that come with society, yeah. which was a huge thing. So, in my view, without government intervention, uh, nobody's going to risk this. And, right. Um, I agree. Yeah. I, that yeah. basically. I, I Fair point. Really the job. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. So I, I guess um, my, my question is still the same that I asked when you first presented it over mm. um, uh, from home, and in a way it underscores the point. You, you can do that with uh, you know the equipment you had at university, yeah. but using this it might be a problem. So I, I think the comparison with, with electricity networks, they were differently owned, differently built, but the washing machine was the same in, in the city as in rural area, and you know the quality of electricity was similar. In this case. I would say the end point is the, the devices are the same, but getting the electricity was pretty different in rural areas and urban areas. That, sure, yeah, that is different. A lot of it was wind, actually. Even, uh, even in the here. 60s, a lot of the electricity generation was wind mm. that, that in sure. rural areas. But, but sort of from the user standpoint, the, the, you know, the usability is, is sure. the same. The yeah. question here, like, imagine you, you do, you, you succeed. Mm. Will it create down the line the problem that there are just two different sort of levels of technological development and this one sort of uh, inhibits what you can do using this technology even if you have affordable access uh, so are you uh, I'm just trying to understand are you saying that uh, technologically this is more complex than electricity so the analogy maybe begins to break down can, can I try to maybe I didn't <laughs> quite yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try to say what yeah. you're saying and then <laughs> Slightly answer the question you guys, you guys can yeah. if I'm right. <laughs> so I think he's saying that you needed the fact that everybody was buying the same washing machines from Sears. Right. And then somehow you approximated the power requirements of those mm -hmm. uh, washing machines, as I said, with wind power. And, and both the, uh, you know, again, I'm old or whatever. I yeah. Some of brownouts also in, in cities as well as the, the, the wind just stopped. Yeah. So you had to have sufficiently robust right. washing machines that they could survive that in the which is more expensive, yeah. And so I think what, well, I don't know, that they were analog, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, it, just, it just was a set of constraints, and I would imagine that there may be something similar with respect to, yes, the, the, the high-tech stuff that we have here would not run on these networks, but it would probably also be at risk in the cities. So you might just have a lot more robust high-tech stuff, like you're using different kinds of phones or something, but don't involve phones or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is that, so that's yeah, what yeah. the question and answer. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, sometimes actually the innovation that goes into making the stuff more robust in rural areas improves improves the the ecosystem for everyone. Um, and there's an enormous amount of scale if you can get that scale in these rural areas in Africa. I'm Sixty percent is rural. Exactly, because if you can yeah. get the stuff working on the cheap stuff, yeah. then and then other people pick it up because it's because you can pursue it at scale. Because yeah. it, it works everywhere, and they, they also sometimes you know take a drive. Or right. Yeah. Uh, not to mention Facebook. Um, Yes. I think were, Google was also interested in different ways of uh, reaching out communities. Yes, free interesting. Basics and all that, so Google Loon. Yeah, and I wonder yeah. if, what, what's your experience with that and, and mm. where they can help and where, where, where you think they should try. Yeah, so on the infrastructure side, I think it, it, it was an abysmal failure. Uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the gliders, they've basically given up with, with that project. Um, Google Loon is a kind of a fun you know, Google X project, uh, it's cool, but it's it's not something I would say, you know, I would take seriously for a village. Um, in terms of Facebook Zero, that was a failure in India. Um, it oh, was a... Had something in South Africa as well. Uh, yes, they have a little bit, but it also hasn't really taken off. Uh, so you get this Facebook Zero where they strip out all the images and they give you a very low bandwidth Facebook. And we found most people just didn't like it and they wanted the full experience. And we're prepared to rather just run out of data and <laughs> use the <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Um, I would say the most interesting thing for me is Starlink by Elon Musk uh, with the satellite. Starlink? Starlink. So he's deploying low Earth orbit satellites across the whole planet. But then to does, he the does he own the data though? Uh, I have no idea who, no. I mean, he would just say, I'm transiting the data. Um, but the idea is that you're going to get 
full coverage with low latency. The latency has always been the problem with satellites. But he's going to get less than fiber latency, he claims, for undersea cables with these very low Earth, Earth orbit satellites. Um, and I don't know how he's going to get the terminal cost down. Um, but time, time will tell. But if we have these... Perhaps these are simply going to be gateways into these cooperative community networks in some of these remote regions where there's no fiber. Or if the terminal price, the price comes re really far down, maybe everyone's just going to have a Starlink box in 10 years. <laughs> mm. I, what, you sort of brought this in at the very end, but I think it's been really important, this idea of the localization. Yeah. And, and um, some people, some some of the big tech are paying some kind of lip service to that, uh, particularly I guess Apple. But but I'm just wondering because a lot of people are trying to figure out what's going to happen with these things, and, and again we get to the, to the utility money and everything. Yeah. Um, but they know that there's a trust issue. They know that there's particularly trust of American or Canary Island or whatever company's issues. Um, so, so I wonder, are they willing? Are, are, I don't know if you would trust them anyway, but is, are they? Are they? Are, is anybody talking about? Yes, we would like to support you with this kind of process and keep keep the data truly local into your into your communities or whatever. Or is that something maybe you think is essentially has to be done in these distributed ways? Yeah, I haven't had um, a lot of people interested in the keeping the data lo local. <laughs> because the data but, is yeah. Yeah. I mean, data is really the new uranium. Not gold even. Um, but there's definitely been support from infrastructure. Yes, I mean, Facebook wants to look at building low-cost cellular base stations and that sort of thing. But on the data side, it's quiet. Yeah. I, can, I can help yeah. as well, too. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Is there room for standards or open-source types of standards to propagate your types of technology? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, so, I mean, all the all, all the standards that um, we are developing for one example would be so we have an IETF standard to access white space. Uh, so right now, TV white space is something called the PAUSE standard. It's an IETF standard. Uh, we want to move that into other spectrum like cellular spectrum. So we're working on something called PAUSE C, which is a uh, a standard to access cellular spectrum, white space spectrum. Uh, and we absolutely believe in building open standards so that anyone can innovate solutions with a common standard. Yeah. I was interested, uh, I'm not sure if I fully understand, but you said you're going to a conference to talk to the providers about being nicer about sharing spectrum. Right. So when you're talking about that, are you talking about uh, like Comcast and those kind of providers, or who are you talking to, and how do you try to sell it to them? Like why they should do this beyond out of the goodness of their heart? Yeah, so um, we'll be... <laughs> We'll be talking to, uh, so it's in Europe, so there'll be Vodafone and Orange and, and those kind of operators. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So they're interested in this because they realize they are reaching saturation. So they are looking for solutions that can provide much lower co or can create low-cost solutions in some of these rural areas. Like a $1,500 LTE base station is very interesting to them because they're investing, you know, Fifty thousand dollars to put up a, a base station. Um, so they're interested in this project on this low-cost device side. On the spectrum side, I'm kind of saying, well, there are these areas you don't want to go. Um, what do you have to lose by sharing a spectrum with a, a database, and maybe get some discount on USF fees? We'll see where that goes. But you're not going there anyway. Um, the database is built in such a way that if you do go there you just switch that channel off and they can take over but you n you're, not, you're not actually losing customers because especially if it's an area where you're not even going that's kind of my line of argument but, yeah. yeah just following up on that I'm wondering what you're, what you're finding in the way of the role of the regulators in the local countries uh, they have in, in these places they tend to be government, semi-government organizations, yes. and they, they tend to have a lot of uh, control over what's happening in the airways in their countries. Is there any traction that yeah. you're seeing for opening up the space? 
um, and compelling the operators to do so. And also, as yeah. part of that, they, they generally oversee the USFs, um, mm -hmm. which I've seen is basically invested in laying a lot of fiber and putting up a lot of towers. Yes. Um, is there, but I, I haven't really looked closely, is there any effort to deploy these kind of solutions through, through those funds? Yeah. You mentioned that earlier. About right. Um, so in South Africa, uh, we've worked very closely with the regulator, and they've actually been very um, innovative uh, in uh, and allowed. So we were one of the first countries to have TV white space. All the operators and the broadcasters pushed against it. We went to the regulator, and the regulator said, no, this is a good thing. We don't care what the operators say. This isn't the public good. Do it. <laughs> so it was definitely the right strategy to rather go to the regulator when it comes to opening uh, spectrum. Um, it's a weird dance between the regulators and the operators. The operators are extremely powerful and have very powerful sort of lobby groups that come to parliament and and sort of show the government how wonderful they are and how they've, you know, connected so many people. Um, so, you know, we often need to be a voice uh, of reason coming in and making sure we balance this megaphone of the operators. But definitely the regulators are the right place to go. And there's a group called CRASA, which is a Southern African group of that looks after sort of all the regulators, always a sort of a advisory body. We are um, looking at approaching them to sort of create policy for the whole region rather than trying to go to every single regulator in every country. Um, on the USAF fees, it's new territory for me, so um, we'll see where that goes. But, yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I should stop this. <laughs>